Well, thank you, Judy. Good morning and welcome, everyone. Good morning. So this morning, as we enter into worship, we'll begin with a prayer of confession and assurance of pardon. So with open hearts, handing over our will to God, we pray, O oh God, whose loving knows no ending, still you long to gather us under your wings. For the words of hatred we have spoken and the words of love we have withheld. O oh God, for the walls we have built up and the barriers we have refused to take down. O oh God, for the greed that makes us frantic and the gifts we pass by without seeing. O oh God, for what we have done and for what we have left undone, O oh God. Sisters and brothers, God's promise of mercy is sure. You are forgiven and loved as you are. Come now and rest under God's sheltering wings and know that you are home. Let's enter into our call to worship, and your words are in bold. Ashes have been smeared, and sins have been confessed. We follow our Lord. These times, they are troubling. This journey, it is hard. We follow our Lord. It is God who sustains, not the temptations of this world. In the Lord is our trust, our protection from harm. We follow our Lord. So let us come, let us worship the one whom we serve. We our Lord. God of hope, we journey with you to the foot of the cross. Stay with us when difficulty comes. Grant us courage and peace in the face of persecution. Turn our pain into joy, our mourning into peace. Heavenly Father, we are grateful to you for things like technology that help us bake wonderful things, <laughs> lifting up uh, Eileen's work in the kitchen made easier with the gift of a new oven. The joy of the sunshine, even on a cold day. 
the joy of being together inside the sanctuary, the joy of the pitter-patter of little feet. For all these and everything we haven't said that is on our heart as well, we are grateful to God. And so we say, Today we especially pray for the whole church that strengthened by the disciplines of Lent, we turn from sin to find joy and abundant new life in forgiveness. And we ask, For the nations of this world, especially the people of Ukraine, that leaders seek peace and justice for all people over desires of personal power, we ask. For our sisters and brothers in need, especially the Lilleberg family, their loss of their beloved son, Ethan, and the Berger family, and the loss of their beloved husband and father, Trevor. And Lord, we ask you to put your arms around Pastor Krista as she helps the family navigate their loss. Lifting... We ask, God, that you would give healing and God's people would respond with mercy and compassion toward one another. And we pray for little bumps on the head, too, because those hurt. And so we just lift up little Charlie, too, in prayer. (laughs) But we know he's in the arms of his mom. so. So we say, Lord, have mercy. And we pray for all who experience injustice discrimination, prejudice. Almighty God, help us see one another as God's beloved children and unique creations and help us dare to be people who love and forgive even bigger than you, O Lord, we ask. Merciful and gracious God, we come today lifting those in prayer to you that are on our hearts. All these and including those that we don't speak aloud, but you know, Lord. You know what is on our hearts and you know what their needs are. So, Lord, we just ask you to hear our prayers. Restore us to the joy of your salvation. And uphold us with your Holy Spirit through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And all the people said, Amen. Amen. Philippians chapter 3, verse 17, and chapter 4, verse 1. Brothers and sisters, join in imitating me, and observe those who live according to the example you have in us. For many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. I have often told you of them, and now I tell you even with tears. Their end is destruction. Their God is the belly, and their glory is their shame, is in their shame. Their minds are set on earthly things, but our citizenship is in heaven, And it is from there that we are expecting a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. He will transform the body of our humiliation that it may be conformed to the body of his glory by the power that also enables him to make all things subject to himself. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm in the Lord in this way, my beloved. Blessed be the word of God. Amen. Amen. And our gospel reading today is from Luke chapter 13 today, verses 31 to 35. Jesus' sorrow for Jerusalem. At that time, some Pharisees came to Jesus and said to him, leave this place and go somewhere else. Herod wants to kill you. He replied, go tell that fox, I will keep on driving out demons and healing people today and tomorrow, and on the third day I will reach my goal. In any case, I must press on today and tomorrow and the next day, for surely no prophet can die outside Jerusalem. 
Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, and you were not willing. Look, your house is left to you desolate. I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. in, I heard uh, Tara and Otto's dad say, just because we want it doesn't mean it's going to come any sooner. Now let me think for a minute. I'm going to guess. That's what mommy wants about her car. Oh, I thought, I thought, I, so I didn't hear the whole conversation, but that was interesting. I thought for sure it was about spring. <laughs> That's what I was thinking. Here's, so, uh, is it? Right, so if we want something really, really bad, does it make it come any sooner? Here, draw a picture of something you want really, really bad. Okay? Yeah, something you really, really want. Something you really, really want. Here, pass those. Take one, pass those down. I'm not very fast here, am I, today? Speed is not my thing today, guys. There you go. There's two for you, dear. <laughs> so draw a picture of something that you really, really want. I'm going to be talking today to the big people. You guys, too, if you want to listen, you can listen when I talk to the big people, too. We're discussing things we want up here. Yes. So just, 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 it, it, does, it could be anything, just one thing you really, really want. And today, with the big people, I'm going to be talking about the word desire, which is kind of like the word want. Can I do three? You can do three things. Yes, do three things. What is something you really, really want, Sawyer? More games. More games. All right. Maddie, what is something you really, really want? No idea. Okay, she doesn't know. Do you know what you really, really want? Who knows something they really, really want? Okay. A unicorn surprise. A unicorn surprise. Allison, what do you really, really want? A new horse. A new horse. All right. I don't know what I want. Do you, you're not sure yet? Anybody else want to, you want to say? A unicorn. A unicorn. Wow, oh, that is a big ask. Otto, you know what you want? A fuel tank. A fuel tank. I tried to get that. Lucas. God. Oh, I love your answer, Lucas. Well, sermon's done. Mic drop. <laughs> right? Like, that was it. Like, <laughs> that was so good. So, so can I tell you kids something? We are in a season called Lent right now. And in Lent, uh, we participate in Lent Let's try this one. To, to remember that Jesus spent 40 days in the wilderness without any food or water. And not only was Jesus... Right. For without any food or water. And what was happening to him? He was be, being tempted by Satan the whole time. Satan was like, here, you want to have power over the whole world? If you just say that you'll believe in me as God, then I'll give it to you. And Jesus was starving, and still Jesus said, no way. The only God that's God is God. No other gods, right? That's one of the Ten Commandments that we learned last summer, right? Yeah. 
Now, Sundays are not counted during Lent. So there are 40 days of Lent. Six Sundays is 46 days. Right, so we don't count the Sundays. On Sunday, we get a break from taking a break from things, right? <laughs> so we're 10 days into Lent, you guys. How many days do we have left? I love it. So if there's 40 days left, or 30, right? If there's 40 days total and we're 10 days in, we still have 30 days. You want a baby? That is awesome. Check that. That's what That's what we got up here. That's what she really, really wants, Mom and Dad. When you're counting the Sundays, you have 34 days left. Right. If you count the Sundays, you got 34 days left. Now, let me tell you something, and I want you to think about it. The reason we get Christmas... That's right, and so that Jesus can give us Easter. The reason we have Christmas is so that Jesus can give us Easter. What happens at Easter? He rose from the dead. That means he conquered death, and he conquered all of the sin. And and we celebrate his resurrection. These guys are so good at this. So here's the deal. That's awesome. They're teaching you amazing things. What are these, guys? What are these? Candy canes. So here's the deal. I'm going to give you one now for today because today is Sunday and we're taking a break from Lent and fasting. But you know what? You're going to get a second candy cane, and that's your Easter candy cane. So you remember Jesus' birth all, all through Lent, but don't eat the second one. Okay? So the second one you cannot eat until Easter. How many of you think you can fast from that? Can you do it? So we get, Jesus' birth gives us Easter, right? So where are you supposed to save your candy cane? Right, one you can have today and one you can have on Easter. Let's see how good you do fasting from that Easter candy cane. Okay. (laughs) Thanks, kids. All right, I think we should give them a hand because I think they did a pretty good job today, everybody. What do you really, really want, God? That was so good. Yeah, what we really, really want doesn't always happen, right? We talked about that, actually, uh, at Lenten service this week. basket Um, we talked actually about um, half truths but let's pray first may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be pleasing to you O Lord amen So today I'm just going to give this message in three parts. I'm going to share a little, like I just started now, about the Lenten service message that we had from Pastor Krista on Wednesday. And then I want to give us a historical location for our Luke text today before I do some biblical preaching on uh, Luke chapter 13. So Adam Hamilton wrote the book Half Truths, and that's our book study for Lent. And Pastor Krista will be giving us a midweek message on that book through most of Lent. Hamilton begins in chapter 1 by reading from the Old Testament, actually, reading from Deuteronomy, verses 19 and 20. I'll read some of it here. Moses says to the Israelites, I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Choose life so that you and your descendants may live Loving the Lord your God, obeying him, and holding fast to him, for that means life to you and length of days. So Hamilton asks in the book, has anyone ever said, by a show of hands, here, he asks, so here, I'm going to ask you, has anybody ever said to you, everything happens for a reason? Many of us have probably said it. (laughs) I know I have. Right? This is a true statement, 
if, when saying it, we're telling you, the other person that we live in a world of cause and effect. Then I could see how this could be true, right? But for any other reason, especially with regard to this statement having biblical weight, it's kind of nonsensical. It's our actions that create consequences, good consequences and bad consequences. I'm so glad I called Thomas in 1998. Because that led from one thing to the next thing to the next thing. And eventually, I think I asked him to marry me. So we got married. <laughs> I do actually think that's how it went. <laughs> um, it, was a good it was a good suggestion. It's been 22 years of a good suggestion. Right. But also, what if I'm choosing to text and drive and I hurt somebody? or myself. Is that the will of God or just a really dumb choice by me? So you can see where I'm going here. If we say that God had some hand in the car accident that I just created because I was texting and driving, who's accountable? God or me? In scripture, Moses is preaching to the Israelites about cause and effect. Choosing to live under God's law of love for God and neighbor leads to life and peace for the community. But usually when we say something like, everything happens for a reason, we're not talking about cause and effect. We're speaking in response to suffering. And Pastor Krista this week said, um, with the Burgers family's permission, She spoke to us about how this feels to the Berger family when you say this about Trevor. It's actually really hurtful, and it doesn't help. Here's some other really good one-liners that do not help people when they're suffering. It was meant to be. Must have been their time. It was part of the plan. It must have been God's will. When we seek to console others, and when others seek to console us with these one-liners, I can tell you that they're rarely helpful or comforting. In fact, by saying these, we seem to be saying that God has a purpose for bringing about or allowing situations in which people suffer. That's not the God I know. Earlier this fall, we read through the book of Job, and Pastor Krista did mention Job, too, in her sermon this past Wednesday. Job's friends do a horrible job of consoling him in the second part of that book. (laughs) When we say things like this, we might be assuming that even though we don't understand why something bad happens, we impose on others an idea or a system of beliefs that says that these events, all events, good and bad, are predetermined and fixed by God. So that doesn't even mean I don't even have to get up and go to work, right? Because my life was predetermined and fixed. That's why Paul wrote the letters to the Thessalonians. Because when Paul came and converted them, they were like, all right, we're done now. We don't even have to go to work. And all of a sudden, they were starving and wondering why they were starving. Even though God cares for that bird in the tree, the bird's still got to come down and get the worm, or the bird's going to starve, right? So I'm still confused about this statement and why we think it's comforting. If we believe God is in charge of doling out suffering, we can arrive at some really silly and actually some really scary extremes. Like, silly as in, God meant my team to win the World Series. Or, honey, I'm sorry about forgetting your birthday on February 20th. It was God's will. I mean, this logic, it brings about some really troubling questions, right? Why did God allow millions of Jews to die in the Holocaust? Because if you say that statement, that's what you're saying. Did God really want little children to be murdered in the Sandy Hook school shooting? I don't think so. I don't think, I don't think, why would I think that that would happen for a reason? What would be the reason for a mother to lose her seven-year-old son? 
So at best, when we say something like this, it's maybe a half truth. But I would implore you to scrub it from the list of things we say to comfort people when they're going through difficult times. The notion that God picks winners and losers in professional sports or the stock market, let alone that God intends car accidents, criminal acts, genocide, and mass murder, I think that's worth examining. So I would venture to say those things happen absent of God. Evil is the absence of God, right? So if that's a crunchy statement to you, what I just said, good. Chew on it. I encourage you to talk to me about it later. Uh, I'll be driving to the cities around 7 p.m. this week, so call me then because I'll have about three hours to be free and talk to you on the car phone, not texting and driving. (laughs) The rest of that chapter in Hamilton's books is worth every minute. As Methodists, we strengthen our faith life by looking at these big God questions through the dare I say, remind you of your confirmation, Wesleyan quadrilateral, scripture, tradition, reason, experience, all four. Hamilton does a great job speaking to these half-truths, so I hope I've intrigued you enough that you might listen in on Wednesday evenings on YouTube or come to service or just pick up a copy, your own copy of Hamilton's book, Half-Truths. Now, before I offer what I'm learning about today's gospel from Luke, chapter 13, let me just give you some historical location, because we've been in the book of Luke for a while now, right? So let me just quick give you the highlight reel. It's going to be really fast. Are you ready? Chapter 1 was the birth of John the Baptist, Mary's song, Mary visits Elizabeth. Chapter 2 was the birth of Jesus, and we also get that very rare story of Jesus as the boy at the temple. Remember, he makes his parents crazy because he runs a way they can't find him, they think they're with him, you know, that whole story. Chapter 3, Jesus is baptized. 4, Jesus is tested in the wilderness. We just read that last week. 5, Jesus calls his first disciples. Chapter 6, the blessings and woes chapter. Remember, blessed are, blessed are you who are poor. Chapter 7, Jesus performs many miracles. Chapter 8, Jesus calms the storm. Chapter 9, Jesus sends out the twelve. Chapter 10, Jesus sends out the 72. Chapter 11, Jesus teaches us the Lord's Prayer. And chapter 13 is where we're at today. And today we're talking about Herod's desire, Jesus' desire, and Jerusalem's desire. Herod's desire is to kill Jesus. And they try to warn him. warn him. The Pharisees try to warn him. Jesus' desire is to follow the divine purpose. And Jerusalem's desire is to criminalize truth tellers. In the commentary I read for today, Jesus has been heading to Jerusalem, just to remind you, since chapter 9. In the commentary I read today, in Luke, Jesus accepts even dinner invitations from Pharisees. Reminds us that Jesus' presence at those meals implies collegiality, right? In Luke chapters 3 and 9, we're reminded that Herod has no problem imprisoning and executing outspoken prophets because what does he do to John the Baptist? So we could think the worst of the Pharisees. In fact, our culture kind of tells us to just assume the worst about people, right? But what would be better to do? Not all the Pharisees and not all the Jewish people and not all the Sadducees wanted Jesus dead or Jesus wouldn't have had a following. So I think the lesson today in this is to don't assume the worst of people but assume the best. Pastor Kelly, uh, my home church pastor, in her newsletter wrote this. And so I'll leave you with this today. In this Lenten season, she says, let us be encouraged. I say, let us desire. Thilo is the Greek word for desire. Let us desire to look for ways to wage peace, to sacrifice, maybe to fast, but for sure to pray 
to live a little bit leaner right now and to see Jesus first in people, not assume the worst, to see Jesus' ways as our ways and to live into Jesus' name and to do our best to imitate Christ. Let us pursue what makes for peace. That's Romans 14, 19. So now in the confidence of children of God, let's pray together the Lord's Prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us uh, give one another uh, the sign of peace. This could be elbow bumps or handshakes. or whatever. Please rise. and reconciled people, let us offer ourselves and our gifts to God. Amen. You may be seated. So let's read responsively our benediction. As we go into the world this week, think the best of people. Strengthen us to enter into your work without fear. Fill our hearts with your spirit. We are your disciples, filled with love, ready to serve. We give thanks for your love and grace. Go forth to love and serve the Lord.